Our next speaker, Alison McLennan, is a PhD candidate. She's also vice chancellor scholar at the university's College of Law. She studied science, cellular and molecular biology and law as an undergraduate at ANU. And she's interested in the regulation of emerging technology, particularly biotechnology. Alison's currently researching the regulatory, intellectual property, and biosecurity issues raised by recent developments in synthetic biology. Please welcome Alison McLennan. Thank you. So we've heard about uh, some of the science behind synthetic biology. And I'm going to talk about some regulatory issues, so legal problems that synthetic biology might raise, and think about some ways that we might address some of those legal problems. So I'm going to touch on three main areas of legal concern. The first is biosafety, so risks to um, human health or the environment that might be posed by synthetic biology. Uh, the second area is biosecurity. So the risk of synthetic biology being used for dangerous or illegal purposes like bioterrorism. And the third area that I'm going to talk about is intellectual property, which is uh, issues to do with the ownership of synthetic biology and access to the research and any products that might come out of that research. So in terms of biosafety, there are a couple of ways that synthetic biology could affect safety. One way is, for example, if someone is working in a laboratory and there's some kind of accident and um, synthetic DNA or some synthetic organisms actually cause harm to that person. Another way that safety could be affected is if there's an accidental release of synthetic organisms or synthetic DNA into the natural environment outside the lab. And as yet, we don't really know how synthetic organisms could affect the natural environment, and we also don't know what the risks to our own health could be. So scientists are thinking about this already, and there are some scientific ways to reduce these risks. For example, making synthetic organisms so that they can't actually exist, they can't survive outside the lab. So if they did escape, they wouldn't be able to cause much harm in the natural environment. Um, so there are also legal ways that we could reduce these risks. And in Australia, we have a system to regulate gene technology, um, gene technology research and the release of genetically modified organisms. And that's done by the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator, who assesses all the risks involved in different research or release activities. And they do approval and licensing. And then they monitor those activities to make sure that any risks are being managed appropriately. But there are questions about how that might apply to synthetic biology research. Um, the existing regime that we've got at the moment would probably cover uh, what we could call large-scale metabolic engineering, which um, refers to some of the work that Desmond described and also Claudia, which is kind of like an extension from traditional gene technology. But whereas this existing regime was designed to deal with getting natural DNA from places like uh, bacteria or plants and cutting it up and pasting it into different places and seeing what happens. Uh, synthetic biology brings the potential to have synthetic DNA that's actually built from scratch. So there are questions about whether this regime would cover those, those sorts of technologies. So there's potentially some gaps to think about. Moving on to biosecurity, uh, biosecurity means protecting the public, so us, from the, the um, harm that could be caused by biological weapons or bioterrorism. The reason synthetic biology creates a security headache is because it's a dual-use research area. So that means that the very same research or technology, the same experiments and the same results could have both positive applications, benefits like in medicine, creating new medicines and new vaccines, but they could also have negative consequences. They could have dangerous uses or illegal uses. And this makes it really hard for lawyers and policymakers to work out what to do, how to design a regulatory system, because on the one hand, we have to minimize the risk of the really serious harm that could come out of um, biological weapons and bioterrorism. But on the other hand, we want to get the benefits 
of scientific research, you know, the positive outcomes for a society. And we don't want to make life too hard for scientists so that there are so many laws in their way that they can't actually do their research. So in Australia, we have a biosecurity system and we manage it by controlling access to dangerous bugs, to dangerous bacteria and viruses. So we control who can access those bugs and what they can use them for and how they're transported and how they're stored and those kinds of activities. And the goal of controlling those activities is to stop dangerous bugs from being stolen or being used for dangerous or illegal activities. Um, but synthetic biology, as I said, brings this potential to have synthetic DNA. And as Claudia mentioned, you can now order DNA from gene synthesis companies and receive it in the mail. So this means that we don't actually need access to dangerous bugs to do research using their DNA. And eventually, sometime in the future, we might be able to build dangerous organisms. So controlling access to naturally occurring dangerous organisms might not be enough to manage the biosecurity risks. So these are some options for managing those risks. One way to deal with it would be just to let the scientists sort it out. So let scientists work out principles to guide their own research and, and set out what they will and they won't do. Another option is to let research institutions like universities control their scientists and monitor what they're doing. Uh, we could modify the existing legal system that we have that controls the dangerous organisms so that it also controls the DNA from those organisms. Um, another way to go would be to moni monitor uh, gene synthesis activities. So we could get the companies that actually build DNA to, to monitor who is ordering DNA, where are they situated, what do they want the DNA for, are they part of a university or are they just someone doing something in their backyard. So we could ask, we could encourage and ask gene synthesis companies to do that or um, alternatively the government could require gene synthesis companies to do that monitoring. Um, and in Australia at the moment there isn't actually, there aren't many gene synthesis companies so if you want synthetic DNA you have to most likely get it from outside Australia. So another way to go would be controlling the import of synthetic DNA into the country. So the last area of um, legal concerns that I wanted to raise is intellectual property. Um, there are various different kinds of intellectual property, but the one that's most relevant for synthetic biology is patents. So patents give an inventor a monopoly, which means the inventor is the only person that has the right to make their invention and to use it and to sell it to other people. So effectively, they can control who can access their invention and what it's going to cost. So in Australia, if you want to get a patent, you apply to IP Australia and they will examine your application and they'll check that it meets various criteria. So it has to be something new, it has to be novel, it has to be inventive and it has to be useful. And we give people patents so that they can get some, some return on their investment. It's an incentive to encourage people to do useful research and creative, innovative things. But um, patents in biotechnology are really controversial. And you might have heard of some of these issues in the context of gene patents, which have been discussed a lot recently. Um, so there are all sorts of questions like, are there some things that just should not be patented at all? Um, what should we do if patents are getting in the way of biologists trying to do their research? And what should we do if patents make things like, for example, genetic tests really expensive so that people can't access them? These kinds of problems can happen when science progresses and there are new technologies that don't really fit into the patent system, which is now quite old. So we can end up with patents that are just way too broad. The scope of the um, monopoly that's granted to the inventor is, is just way too broad. Or patents can be granted too early in, the, in a new field of scientific research. There are some synthetic biology patent applications in Australia. Um, there are some that have been filed by Synthetic Genomics, which is the company that commercializes the research done by the J. Craig Venter Institute that we've talked about a little bit. So there are a handful of patent applications already, but none of these have been granted so far. And the last thing I wanted to mention is some synthetic biologists have decided 
We're just going to steer clear of all the problems that can be caused by the patent system. <coughs> and we're going to set up an online community, which Claudio referred to, where we can share our research and our data. This is quite different from patenting because patenting involves keeping your research secret. So you don't tell anyone what you're doing until you apply for the patent. And then once you get the patent, you can control who can access that invention. Whereas these scientists have decided we're just going to make our research public and we're going to put it out there so other synthetic biologists can look at it and use it and, and modify it and, and improve it. And then we can collaborate together and push the field of synthetic biology research forward in a collaborative way. So it's worth thinking about whether that kind of sharing of data and results should be encouraged. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you.